Firstly, I do appreciate what you have done. You elaborate that Islam uh, doesn't teach uh, violence. Even uh, non-violent in Islam is uh, something imperative. Um, but I want to know more from you what we have to do uh, for many teachings in Islam uh, which teach violence. For example, Islam, law, war, uh, Islam teach someone killing, uh, must, must be killed. Uh, I think Islam, uh, for this, uh, have has uh, two sides at the same time. We can use Islam as uh, non-violence, but also we can say that Islam teaches violence too. Uh, thank you for, for, the, for the question. Uh, uh, I wanted to uh, say this about the role of religion and issue of violence. I came from Thailand, which is, uh, you know, as everyone knows, it's a Buddhist society. Uh, the question becomes that uh, Buddhism teaches uh, abstain from taking the life. The first Buddhist precept, sila, is abstain from taking the life of living beings. And yet if you look at the history of, let's say, Siam and Myanmar, you have long history of wars between these two Buddhist countries. And if you look at uh, Myanmar today, you know, the Time magazine has a picture of a monk and the caption reads, face of terror in relation to the issue of Rohingya. I began this lecture by talking about October 6, uh, 1976 in Thailand. I did tell you that a Buddhist monk came out at the time before that and said that they thought we are all communists. We were all communists at Thammasat University. And they said that killing communists is not a sin. So, even for Buddhism, you know, let alone Christianity, religion can be used to justify violence. If you compare that with Islam, I would say that Islam is in a way less pretentious about that because it is clear, because I do not say that Islam does not teach violence. I'm saying that the teaching of violence Ways, other ways of fighting in Islam is within its moral sphere. It is within, you know, uh, an understanding there are certain things you can do, certain you cannot do, you know, within violence. I'm not saying that Islam does not teach violence. It's not true. The, pro the Prophet participated in war, you know. But there were people who counted the time that the Prophet participated in war, and they said that the Prophet was in war for only about, maybe, you know, real battle, one and a half day or something like that. What about the rest of the time that he was doing? I mean, these are the things that, that uh, we, we are talking about. And you ask the question, what can we do for um, people who uh, teach Islam like that? I'm not saying that they are wrong. I'm saying that we, because Islam teaches both, I think it's in our interest, in the Ummah interest, in the world's interest, to identify and underscore uh, the alternatives or the other teachings that sometimes have been relegated to marginal importance. Why do we allow that to happen? I mean, we should pick some of those up and, and argue for it. How is the place of violence in the paradigm of non-violence? or any theory of uh, non-violence. Um, is violence totally un unacceptable? Or how far, uh, or if it is acceptable, how, um, to what certain extent it is acceptable? In other words, uh, I would like to ask, um, how good actually is uh, the non-violence uh, paradigm? Is it, is it uh, can it be implemented 
in many different in various contexts or or actually it is limited so uh, especially if, if we think that our violence itself um, there are methods for example uh, we uh, try to differentiate probably there is structural violence there is physical violence or the cultural violence and many kinds of violence thank you good question um, two ways to answer that um, one of the problems of uh, people interested in issues of violence and use what I would call a broad notion of violence you know also my teacher like John Galton what he has done is that he argues that there are different uh, layers of violence that we should call uh, direct violence that is violence between people and all that and then structural violence uh, what is the difference the difference is um, you know um, direct violence is when someone kill another it's direct violence structural violence is that you know when a child died because of malnutrition in a society that is capable of feeding the child so if a society is producing rice, producing food, capable of feeding the child, and yet you have malnutrition or death by starvation in a society, then those deaths, according to Galtung, is a result of structural violence. Okay? And the third one is cultural violence. What is that? When a person, say, when a man, when a husband hit a wife, that can be, if that is a singular act, that is not cultural. But if 40% of husband hits the wife, this is cultural. Because there's something within that society which says that to do that is acceptable. The notion of culture is to make things acceptable or acceptable in, in the process. What I mean is that if you look at this in this way, you know, also psychological violence and many others violence, you end up thinking that then the whole world is defined by violence. A colleague of mine who uh, is publishing his, uh, her, new, her book, uh, which is coming out of Syracuse University Press, um, uh, the, the title is Humor and Nonviolent Struggle in uh, Serbia. It's a study of the art power movement using humor uh, as a way to fight dictatorship. Some of the critics argue that humor is hurtful. Humor can be hurtful in some sense. You know, you make jokes of, uh, you make jokes of dictators. You make jokes of uh, the prime minister of Thailand. You make jokes of the, the then uh, president of Indonesia, like Suharto, or what have you. And so we make jokes. Is this joke acceptable, so to speak? Now, um, if you define the world violently this way then it leaves you very limited space for nonviolent actions. So I think one has to choose. There are people who does that. There are people who do that. That is to say, they use a very broad understanding of violence and therefore their avenue of nonviolent action will be limited. I cannot make jokes, I cannot criticize, I cannot hurt you culturally or otherwise. So the area of action that you will do will be limited. And there are people who say, oh, you can do lots of things. I tease my students, for example, um, is damaging properties nonviolent or violent? If you, you bring damage to property, of course that's against the law. But the question is, is that violent or nonviolent? In your town, Chicago, once there was a factory, and the factory is on uh, the, the, what is it, the Bank of Hudson and it released all kind of toxic uh, things into the river Hudson for a long time and the citizens could not do anything with that one day in the early 70s something happened a guy dived down into the river and clogged the drainage system of the factory and then, in a way, almost, you know, destroyed the factory. Nobody can, still could, couldn't catch him. And he's called the fox. The question is, is the action of the fox violent or nonviolent? 
You follow? If you are now destroying a weapons producing factory, would you call that violent or nonviolent? Yes. You see, so it's more problematic than than simply to say that this is violent or nonviolent. I am sharing those because I do not have a direct answer to your very important question. But I wanted to say this in addition to that. What does nonviolence do to us as human beings? I think for me, nonviolence gives us alternative. I use the word alternative several times. Why? Let's imagine yourself. If you live in a house and the house is in a bad neighborhood, there will be thieves, there are people who break into your home. So what you have under your pillow is a gun. Okay? If someone break into your house, what would you do? You are in the house, you have a gun under your pillow, someone break into your house, what would you do? What would you do? <laughs> Before shooting. You, you, Ulil is so young, you know, he's, he's a youthful guy, always. So he goes for the guns. No, I think the first thing is that then you put your hand under your pillow and touch the gun. People argue that by reaching for the gun, you are now fighting the crime. You are, the gun becomes your alternative. I argue differently. I think the existence of the gun closes other alternatives. You follow? When you have the gun, you can think of one or two ways to deal with the issues, and then it stops with the gun. If you don't have the gun, you can think of a hundred ways more. So the existence of the gun itself, you know, you use the term paradigm. This is the paradigm that we are talking about. But as long as you continue to believe that the earth moves around the sun, you know, you will find all kinds of reasons. You go back to the earth, move around the sun. So if you, you throw away the earth, move around the sun image, then you will think how the universe works. And there's a possibility that, oh, maybe the sun is in the middle and the earth move around the, the, the sun, or vice versa. You follow? And that's what Kuhn's paradigm is about, I think. It's, it's about uh, a radical alteration of how you think about the same thing and throw away some of the things that you believe all your life in order to find new alternatives. Yeah. So, I mean, just to think about it. Thank you, um, Professor Chaiwan, for your uh, wonderful presentation. My name is Dadi from Ubi and Sharif Hidayatullah, Jakarta. I have two, thing, two things in mind. One, the story of uh, Haji Fan, you told um, in the book, just uh, translated into Indonesian. He was the father, the Thai Muslim father who gave up uh, the struggle and forgive the one who killed um, his son to end the violence in Southern Thai in the 1980s. Um, the second one, people talk about religion and violence uh, and sees uh, and comes, comes up with uh, three uh, different perspectives. One, religion as a strong cause for violence. The second one, religion as a weak cause for violence. And the third one, religion is actually a cause for peace. Now, what, what you have uh, told us uh, this evening is actually, I, will, I believe is, is, is the, the fourth uh, perspective, which is, that is to say, religion is, can actually be a strong cause for peace. But I was wondering how, like how many Haji Fan that we need to actually, we can come up with the idea that religion can actually be uh, a strong cause for peace. Would, would you think that the non-violence action that you, uh, uh, you told us can actually be implemented in, let's say, um, basic education system, in elementary school? or just like in, in like this gathering like this. 
So I, would, I was thinking that uh, maybe in the future um, we, take lot, we, we take a lot of lessons from uh, what you just said and we need somebody, somebody who can actually translate that and implement it in it so that everyone since childhood can actually learn something more for peace. Thank you. Thank you for three important questions, my response. Uh, the first one, uh, I began the nonviolent Christian with the story of Haji Fan who lost his son and he forgave. I was in Patani on Saturday, this past Saturday, um, and I went to two houses. Uh, the houses belong to two, not really belong, but the two women who stay in, in, in these two houses. The first one, uh, the woman there, her name is Rahima. And Rahima lost a son and a husband to the violence. And I sat with her and I asked her, you know, the past year or so, her husband, her husband just died because of the injury, but it lasted for some time. Uh, I asked her, are you angry with those who kill your husband? She said, it's God's will. I'm not angry at them. But my son and my husband died. I'm very sad, she said. But, and I said, how, how do you live, so to speak? And she said, because I believe in God. And I believe that people, you know, the end of us, all of us as, as Muslims, are already predestined. So what I'm saying is that for her, Islam was the answer to her tragedy in this sense. I visited another house that belonged to a woman. I think she is 84 years old. She is a Thai Buddhist who speaks Bahasa, who speak, who speak Malay very well. She was in another uh, this, I mean, another village in Patani, but she moved from that village because uh, a few two years or three years ago, her house was burned down. Her husband was killed, his head was cut off, and the body burned. And she said she left the house because she has nothing left, so it with two bags, and I think her children and grandchildren, she said, everyone, leave. She became homeless after staying in that village. She said she knows the language, she, she knows the Muslims very well, she, has done it. she hasn't done anything bad to the Muslim, and yet this is what she received. She left. I asked, are you angry? And whom are you angry with? She said, I, I came to accept the destiny. Something like that. And I said, why? She said, this is the law of karma. This is the role of religion again in, in making people accept certain destinies. I'm not sure whether this is a good way or a bad thing, you know, but it's there. It has this healing quality to it. But if you, if you move further and you find that there are certain cultural elements within religion to do that. So you read, for example, the work that was done in the Middle East by um, Peace Research and others, they talk about the notion of sulha, reconciliation through forgiveness, you know, accept some of the responsibility and doing that. In the Middle East, a lot of this are happening. The second point is that, what it means is that there are many other cases that we can identify. I still don't know how it works, and when I talk to them, I feel that she is still angry. You know, despite what she told me, but I can, I can sense from her tone, I hope I'm, I'm wrong, but, but, you know, I had a long conversation with her. The second point I think is more important, Methodological, and I have argued with people all over the places that people misunderstand the location of religion as a factor in the conflict equation. That's why people think that religion causes conflict or religion causes violence. I think this is a methodological error. What I say. Religion does not work that way. 
you know, religion works not as, not in terms of causality, I would argue. Religion works in terms of justification. That is to say, religion functions in the same way as culture. Culture justifies act. Culture does not cause act. You know, something else cause act. Example, there are people who came late to this lecture. You know, and we can say that people who came late to this act, uh, lecture, they came late. What are the causes? Several things. The most common cause? Jakarta traffic. It's common cause. The less common cause? I slept over. I ate and I had something to do, you know. But people don't say those things. You know, and then people might come and then they will say, when, if I saw them, I will call, come into the room. And I will ask, why don't you come into the room? They will say, oh, because uh, I don't want to interrupt the lecture. Meaning, I am good manners. This is culture. This is justification. The fact is, you are late because either of the traffic or because you overslept. You know, so I mean, religion is the same thing. Religion can justify, can be used to justify violence, can be used to justify nonviolence. And I would argue that the proximity between religion and the state makes it highly vulnerable to violence. Meaning, the closer religion is to the state, the higher degree of violence it can be used. Buddhism in Thailand. Buddhism in Myanmar, Buddhism in Sri Lanka, you know, religion of peace. But when they align themselves with the state, the face of Buddhism turns ugly and violence. So there's a study of um, Michael Jerison, Buddhist theory. There's a study of Buddhism in southern part of Thailand. Temples become military camps. You know, the monks uh, were there for symbolic, and, and, and in fact, I work for a National Reconciliation Commission, uh, one of the commissioners, uh, government appointed in 2005 and six. The group of people who call for the dissolution of National, National Reconciliation Commission, the first group was the Buddhist monks. It's amazing, you know. So, so religion can be used in either ways, and we have seen it uh, more ways than one. The third one is um, about nonviolence um, and children. I don't have the answer, but I have a story to tell. And this is the story of a young girl. Uh, she's about three years old, and her name is It's Poddy. If you translate it to English, it's enough. What is it in Bahasa? Jukup. Ah, okay. So this girl's name is Jukup. Jukup went to school, and one day Jukup came home, and she sat with her father, and she told her father, today Jukup went to uh, school, and Jukup met Yesan, and Yesan pushed Jukup. Yesan is a bigger guy, and Yesan pushed Jukup, so Jukup fell down. Father listened to Jukup, and father said, oh, why did you allow Yesan to do that to you? Next time when you see yes and yes and push you, you push back. Okay? Jukup listened for a while and she looked at her father and then she said, I remember her saying, she said, Jukup push yes and yes and push Jukup, Jukup push yes and yes and push Jukup, never ends. And I did not make this up. This is a child's wisdom that we have to listen to. It's amazing how the child can teach us. And but really, one of the problems is our education. It corrupts all of these things, unfortunately. Religious and otherwise. The first one, is there any connection between the violence or sadism with uh, education, as we know today, a developed country or developed country doing the same thing to do the, their interests. And the second one, how could we possibly have the solution to prevent 
the violence when we are in the middle of the violence itself. Say, say that again, the second question. The second question is, how could we possibly have the solution to prevent the violence when we are in the middle of the violence itself? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, first one is about violence in education, right? Uh, violence in education. Um, the question about education, I think, as Mother Lee has brought up, is uh, a very important one. And the problem I can see, I, can, I cannot answer you, I can give you a response uh, based on what I have been doing. When I was working for the National Reconciliation Commission, one of the hardest parts of my, uh, you know, writing this report, we have a 50 person commissions. And some of them are government officers, some of them ministers, some of them military and all that, you know, and intellectuals and local leaders and academics and what have you. And the chair was the former prime minister of Thailand, Anand Panyarashi. And I was, as I told you, as the technical director, and I, I try to suggest certain areas. For example, education uh, on history education. I said that the problem with problems in Southern Thailand is that nationalist history dominates everything. Nationalist history dominates everything in the sense that it then justifies Bangkok's uh, dominance over the South. And what it has done is that it then relegates uh, you know, uh, local history into marginal importance, if not abolish it altogether. I'm not saying that we should have only local histories. I'm asking for possibilities where historical studies or historical texts for children could have uh, side by side, you know, history seen from, the, from Bangkok and history seen from Batani, for example. Can you have some of those things? I was shot down like anything. You know, the bureaucrats, the ministers, the military, almost everyone disagree with me that this will cause all kinds of problems. The, the issue of education is that education, unfortunately, is not about you know, imparting knowledge or uh, bringing up character in, in children, in students and all that. But as long as education is connected with the state project, it has this bend in it. And therefore, some of the ideas that is creative or progressive about uh, calling the state into question, sometimes it's very difficult to accept. So Ministry of Education will not allow. Even the use of language. We propose that because the majority of people in the South use Malay language, Bahasa Malayu, uh, Malayu, why don't we accept Malay as a working language? We were attacked left and right. They said this is undermining education in the whole country, so to speak. So I said, but we use other working language already in our passport. There's English language, and, you know, double license and some other things we have, all this. They don't accept it. So what I'm saying is that education in itself, uh, certain, certain areas of education is conducive, is um, contributing to problem of violence is not, uh, you know, weaken the issue of violence. Um, solution to, to prevent violence while we are already in violence. I am taught this, I was taught this way. I was taught that conflict, if conflict is complex enough it is easier to solve. That is to say, if you look at conflict and you see nothing but clarity, you know, it's very difficult to solve. So the complexity of conflict dynamics will provide you with openings of how you solve the problem. You, you follow what I'm saying? That is to say, you say you are in the middle of violence. It doesn't mean that everything else is under it. There are areas of violence. There are areas of nonviolence inside that. So the example I, I didn't explain to you, but for example, the protest march in Patani in 2000, 
uh, and seven, you know, in 2007. That is in the middle of violence. And yet you find example of fascinating nonviolent protests within it. You know, you can, you can see it. And this is the subject of my new book, which is coming out soon. I call it um, nonviolent space, future society. You know, we look at uh, nonviolent incidents inside conflict and violence. And I would argue that only inside conflict and violence you will find some, some of these things. And I take you further. Even in case where you find extreme violence, for example, concentration camp during the Nazi times, you can still find acts of nonviolence, acts of uh, kindness possible within. You find, you, you know, you have, um, 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 you have heard of the name like Oskar Schindler, who saved the lives of the Jews and all that. But there are many others. There are uh, Richard Pesek, Resek, who is a, a Nazi guard, who helps the Jews. He was finally shot. So it's possible to look inside violence and you find this, so to speak. There's a, you know, in Liberia, there's a soldier who helped the village uh, being under attack and they show the villagers how to flee. So inside some of this violence, you can find incidents of nonviolence at work as well. This is possible. Uh, the Bapak Polis ini penting sekali kedudukannya karena dia menjaga keamanan di Indonesia kan. Uh, bagaimana saya menyarankan kepada dia supaya mir kekerasan lah gitu. Padahal tugas dia itu ya identik dengan kekerasan because it's part of the state, right? Uh, jadi, uh, jadi uh, apakah mir kekerasan itu hanya proyek-proyek kecil atau dia bisa besar gitu? Uh, Saya bertanya ini karena Cewa, Profesor Cewan pernah menjadi penasehat apa, penasehat pemerintah di sana untuk urusan-urusan dan kekerasan dan bagaimana opsi-opsi dan kekerasan. Uh, is it, uh, is it really, uh, apa, apakah memang betul-betul mungkin apa yang bisa dilakukan oleh uh, negara dalam kerangka dan kekerasan ini? Karena dari beberapa tadi menjawab pertanyaan tadi misalnya ya, uh, Profesor Cewan itu seperti seperti apa? Uh, uh, fed up dengan apapun yang terkait dengan state gitu kalau saya tidak salah itu I, uh, uh, itu yang pertama jadi saya mau tahu pengalaman dia mengajarkan nir kekerasan kepada penguasa itu uh, seperti apa dan dan uh, dan apa yang bisa uh, saya pelajari darinya karena saya sekarang belajar bekerja dengan polisi uh, dan salah satu fungsi polisi ya menegakkan apa order ya dan salah satunya dengan kekerasan because state is yeah, the only institution that is uh, gitu dengan kekerasan. Yang kedua saya punya teman Ahmadiyah. Uh, kalau boleh saya tanya yang kedua ya dan mereka berbicara mengenai uh, sebagai salah satu organisasi yang institutionally uh, menyebarkan nir kekerasan gitu. Tapi mereka tidak menggunakan istilah nir kekerasan saya kira. Mereka menggunakan lebih banyak pis ya, bukan nir kekerasan ya, sama dia. Uh, tapi saya tidak tahu. Nah, cuma dilema dari dari pis yang dia dari nir kekerasan yang disampaikan oleh Profesor Cewat adalah dia menjadi efektif kalau dia besar kan gitu ya. Karena kalau I don't know again ya, just let me know. Uh, Karena besarlah 3.000 orang misalnya memprotes bersama Gandhi, maka dia menjadi efektif gitu. Padahal e, kalau satu orang, dua orang, sepuluh orang kurang efektif dia gitu. Sebagai senjata, sebagai weapon seperti yang digambarkan oleh Profesor Caiwan tadi. Nah masalahnya adalah e, memperbesar ke, ke apa kegiatan kita, gerakan kita dari 10 ke 3.000 itu. Dan yang paling sulit itu kan dari 10 ke 100 because once you are you 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 got uh, a thousand person, it will be easier for you to get another nine thousand person to get it ten per ten thousand gitu. Nah, jadi uh, kecilnya ini kan yang besar itu yang 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 tidak selamanya mudah dan saya kira itu yang paling yang paling yang paling crucial kan paling susah untuk dikembangkan ya. Jadi bagaimana kita mengembangkan 
nir kekerasan dan menjadikannya labor dalam istilahnya kusok tadi itu uh, sehingga menjadi betul efektif tetapi uh, ya memp- mencapainya itu susah sekali meyakinkan orang dari 10 menjadi 100 gitu karena kalau kita udah dapat 5000 menjadi 10000 itu nggak terlalu susah kan kira-kira gitu ya kalau tentara udah ada pendemo yang Uh, udah ada yang mulai membalikan diri dan yang membalikan dirinya itu udah 100 dia akan berhitung dia akan ikut berbalik atau dia uh, apa terus menerus membela rezim misalnya gitu ya, itu pertanyaan saya eh, yang pertama mengenai negara kedua bagaimana ini bisa membesar dan saya mau tanya pengalaman personal uh, profesor Caiwan di dalam mengembangkan gerakan-gerakan ini sejauh mana dia dia menjadi besar karena kalau tidak besar jumlah gerakan itu dia menjadi kurang efektif kira-kira gitu ya sama ya thank you ya um, the role of the state and, and nonviolence um, um, I have another hat which I wear and and I head a small think tank island called Strategic Nonviolence Commission uh, I used to be its vice president for 10 years and the important thing about this think tank is that it was inside the National Security Council of Thailand. Inside it, appointed by the Prime Minister. Uh, we, what our task is to provide, I would call, nonviolent alternatives to policies and to how the state deals with problems of conflicts. It doesn't mean that the state will accept or adopt whatever we suggest. But, you know, as our think tank, we suggest uh, certain things. And sometimes it takes it, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we have our input in, in certain policy issues and whatnot. Sometimes, you know, they just dis- disregard it. So I have been doing that as the vice president of this uh, SNC for a while. The president, uh, the chair of that, was a deputy secretary general of Thailand's National Security Council uh, at that time. Now, we were kicked out by the government, you know. They said, thank you very much, your service is no longer required. And that's in the letter from the Prime Minister. So we are out, and we are now outside of the government, and we were supported by um, uh, independent funding at the moment. But we still do our uh, um, think tank uh, policy issues. Among other things, we came up with prime ministerial order working on state functionaries, including the police, to suggest certain issues of, that we think are in line with nonviolent actions. For example, in Japan, you know better than that, and you know better than me, and in terms of, uh, we have community police. We have police that work with the community. We have police that thrives on the issue of trust within the community. For us, we do not have those kind of things. We are trying to suggest there's a possibility of some of these issues. We provide, I did some training for border patrol police uh, on nonviolence, and this is very funny, because when they invited me to conduct this training, uh, I went with my colleagues and my, my team, and they asked me politely, they said, okay, we come to your training, what do you need us to bring? You need us to bring sticks and knives and all those things. They thought in training for nonviolence, as long as they do not bring guns, it's okay. <laughs> I said, no, 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 leave everything behind. And we have some of those issues. In my work uh, with the police, I learned something. Um, maybe this is a rare case, but there's this police officer who is the commissioner in, in Hat Yai, in the southern Thailand. Um, big wigs in, Thai, in, in the government wanted to go to the south and uh, organize a, what is it, a public hearing on certain uh, development project, mega projects, and they want to organize a public hearing. Local police warned the government, don't do this because there were opposing uh, groups. Now they are mobilizing and all these things. Of course, the Bangkok uh, government did not accept this, did not believe. So they wanted to hold it anyway. I went there after the incident, but what happened is that the police, uh, we talked to the police commissioner, we, I asked him later, what did you do? You knew that there was going to be a clash. 
you knew that you were policeman of the state, what would you do? He said, I cannot persuade the foolish uh, politicians from Bangkok to stop this. So what I do is that I order my men to go there and do the job without guns. His men say that, how can we do that? Because you are, we know they have weapons. Actually, they don't have, the, the people didn't have weapons, but they have like flags, and the, at the end of the flags is sharpened. So it's almost like spears, so, you know, it's weapon in a way. So they said, pe these people have, have, have weapons. What can we do? You are telling us to leave guns behind. The commissioner told me, I was still ringing the ears, he said, if we, we are not, we, if we as policemen are not prepared to accept the pain, then the people that we are asked to protect will have to suffer. It's better us than them. You know, there are policemen like that, in, that I have encountered. And so, to me, there's a possibility to talk to them or to persuade them in terms of nonviolence. Sometimes the training can come in the form of culture. Some of them soldiers going down to the south, I ask, why do you want to come to the south? It's a Buddhist Thai soldier. He said, oh, I wanted to go down to the south. I wanted to kill 25 of those other, you know, terrible people. And, and I said, why do you want to kill them? Because they killed my friends. We provide them with cultural fluency uh, training to be, what is it, to, to be sensitive to different cultures, and sometimes they can see them in a different light. And sometimes training of the police does not mean cultural training or practical training and like this. It has something to do sometimes with uniform. To make police amenable to nonviolence means they have to have well-protected uniforms. You know why? Because when they stand in the middle of the protest, sometimes they got hit by stones and bottles and whatnot. If they are not protected, they responded with violence. And instead of be being agency of pacification, they become inciter of violence. The best example was the Korean police. Look at their uniform. Well protected, back for all this. You know, it looks, in, uh, you know, um, intimidating, but it's for their protection. So, and also the connection between, let's say, in, the, in terms of protest. So all of this is possible in, in inculcating uh, possibility of nonviolence uh, with them. The last uh, question about scaling up and down of violence. Um, for people interested in nonviolence, nonviolence is not only about mobilizing large group of people. Nonviolence is not about demonstration alone. Nonviolence is not about having tens of thousands of people in the streets. Give you an example. Uh, when the military took over um, the country in 1991, I had a chance to speak with a journalist. So the journalist asked the same question. What are you going to do? We are now under military regime, the coup. So I said, uh, you don't have to mobilize people in the streets. There's a, a bank in Thailand called Thai Military Bank. So I said, what we can do legally, safely, is withdraw the money from the bank. The next day, you know, a headline say, Dr. Shaiwat suggested that we withdraw money from the military bank. <laughs> and my phone never stops. You know, the day after, the president of the bank came up in the news and said, that, yes, our name is Thai Military Bank, but we have nothing to do with the military. You know, I mean, what is that? It means that there are different ways, different methods of nonviolent actions that can be extremely powerful. Bringing people, tens of thousands of people in the street, sometimes is not that powerful. Hunger strike, for example. Gandhi would say that fasting is not for the mass, it's for the few. You know, it's for some people who are, who should do that, but not for the majority of people. So. There are different ways that nonviolent could work. You know, sometimes uh, uh, as a mass movement, sometimes not. You know, as individual, you can do certain things. Thank you.
Universiti Indonesia. Firstly, um, saya ingin menegaskan ada four, at least ada empat paling tidak definisi definisi about religion according to the problem. Firstly, religion, agama adalah love, cinta, hope. Second, adi, adi will act. Religion is a rationality, patient, reason. Uh, and another is a being, is a you are, the island. Agama adalah rasional, uh, akal, atau agama itu dialog. Three is a adi, khusnul khulq. Agama itu adalah akhlak yang baik, yang indah. Yang ketiga ini favoritnya Chandra. Arti ahbabi Allah al hadiyatul sama. Ini hadis favoritnya Chandra. Agama yang paling dicintai di sisi Allah adalah agama yang pure, murni dan lapang, toleran. If these are for the principle, for principle, kalau empat prinsip ini kita tegakkan dalam agama, sebenarnya otomatis violence itu tidak akan terjadi. But there is will be no violence if we uh, consistent with this four principle. Kita tahu dalam agama. Uh, ada prinsip yang kita selalu baca dalam ikhlas, binti, no compulsion, tidak ada paksaan di dalam agama. Paksaan tentu saja berkenaan dengan violence, kekerasan. Sehingga segala bentuk kekerasan yang mengatasnamakan agama itu adalah kejahatan pertama dalam agama itu sendiri. Itu harus kita tegaskan. Kalau ada orang mengatasnamakan agama melakukan kekerasan, offensively, we have to say that it's not religion, it's against religion. Because bahwa yang pertama kali diajarkan oleh para nabi adalah prinsip tadi kita kasih rationality, social hope, dan tolerance. Sehingga dengan demikian, kalau ada orang mengatasnamakan agama melakukan kekerasan, pemaksaan, maka itu adalah sesuatu yang bertentangan secara directly dengan ajaran agama yang sebenarnya yang diajarkan oleh Islam. What I would say juga adalah bahwa kalau kita belajar tadi uh, non virus ini berangkat dari If anyone says a lie, before the ayat, we see that there is a conflict between Kabil and Habil. And Kabil, if we see that what is at what they say, kerjaan dia apa? Profesi Kabil apa? Habil apa? Profesi Kabil itu. Saya tahu profesi kami. Nenek moyang kita ini, kami itu adalah petani. Habil itu pemburu. Kalau lihat dari segi powerful, Habil is more powerful than Kabil. Ketika Kabil Mengancam Habil, I will kill you. Habil say no, no, I will not. Besar, jadi aku, I will not grace. Saya tidak akan menjulur kekerasan saya menyerangkan. Walaupun Habil is more powerful. This is dari Quran. Bahawa pertama darah yang pertama tumpah dalam Islam itu adalah darah Habil. Habil ini more powerful than Habil, but it's not racist. Some people they they tidak melakukan agresif power. Ini 
one of the basic teaching of religion. But now we see the people use these religions to kill others. And at the same time, they say that this is jihad. No man. I would like to say this. Another principle in religion is uh, we say that Iman, Sabah, Hijab. The last is Jihad. Since Allah Akbar, the Fatah was Iman, Sabah. Kalau kita, we are under crisis, then we are uh, treatment, and then Kondisi tidak lagi memungkinkan, we are not to hijrah. All the problem to this, hijrah. Kalau Anda tidak kuat dengan kezalimah, tinggalkan negeri itu. In my country, in my country, in Makassar, if that uh, ruler, dictator, authoritarian, or zalim, the people, the, the people will leave them, leave them, leave the country. Di Makassar itu hampir tidak pernah ada penguasa Zalim. Karena setiap ada penguasa Zalim, rakyat ramai-ramai tinggalin kampungnya. Uh, if you think it by defining religion that way from the Islam, saying that religion is uh, love, is sabab, is iman, uh, is rationality, um, uh, this notion I think is valuable in itself. But what I'm saying is that um, the way which religion has been used in today's world. Uh, I think we have to pay attention to the way it has been used. And in fact, um, you you said, and I'm quoting you, you're saying that keep, you, you, I feel that the sense that you are, you are um, if not angry, annoyed, or troubled by, and you said people use this religion to kill others. This is exactly what happens. Uh, people use this religion to justify the act of killing others. But it's not only Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, everything is me. So I mean, this is a problem that we are facing. We live in a world where religion matters. Religion matters to so many people, but religion has also been used to justify certain things. So when you talk about, uh, you know, why do you go directly to jihad, even in jihad, you know, all of us know very well, that Jihad doesn't mean killing people. Jihad means so many things, you know. Uh, the prophets and his Sahaba used jihad for the first part of their lives after they preached Islam in Mecca. Those are jihad. And people have been tortured, uh, you know, abused and other uh, at the beginning. So these are also uh, 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 jihad. Uh, you talk about in Magasa Hijrah as a way to fight. And you know, for people in nonviolent action, they consider hijrah as nonviolent action as well. And the example of the Prophet, in fact, that is, as you pointed out, is supported by the Quranic verses. You don't you see the world, you know, if you feel that you are oppressed, you you leave. This is God's world, you know, you can do it. So hijrah is, is, um, is uh, fascinating in itself. Um, but the most important thing I feel that you have uh, reminded us is that if you look at an example, um, you look at the Iranian revolution, and you see Iranian revolution as an example of a nonviolent revolution. I mean, this is fascinating. And uh, a, a thinker who has studied this, and I think put this in writing, is none other than Michel Foucault, who did a study of the Iranian revolution and argued that way along that way. So it's fascinating to see Iranian revolution as an example of nonviolent revolution and changes in the world. But when you say Iranian revolution in the world where it is dominated by the Salafi jihadists or something, they don't like it. You know, because it's Shia. And this is part of the part of the problem within our own Islamic world itself. Um, I wanted to, to conclude tonight with uh, sharing with you one of the best-selling books today on New York Times book list. 
and the book, um, best-selling book today on New York Times bestsellers books is called It Is About Islam. The title says It Is, and Is is capital letter, I-S. It Is About Islam. And this is, this is uh, written by a guy by the name of Glenn Beck. And what Beck has said is this, that the thesis of this book is that Islam is on a crash course with the free world. For him, Islam is incompatible with freedom uh, and the way we understand it. Islam is against open election, against minorities' rights, against trial by jury, is incompatible with basic moral decency. So this is the argument by, by Beck. Uh, and it's against man-made law, and it's uh, against rights of mankind to adapt, progress, and moderate. I think we live in a world where, on the one hand, we have our own problem inside the Ummah. Uh, on the other, we have you know, Islamophobia, books like this. Uh, it's, and, and it's not bestseller only in, 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 you know, in the printed copies. In the web, you can find and he has done it everywhere uh, around the world. The question becomes then, how can we call into questions some of the things uh, that has been done, uh, the violence that has been carried out. We talk about the Arab Spring, we talk about Syria, Iraq, and others. And all these are things that are done by the great powers. What the US has done to Iraq, for example, is to destroy the country, you know, and uh, tore the country apart and replaced the country, uh, Saddam Hussein, with Maliki, and Maliki is a Shia. When you replace it that way, what happens is not a, a Shia Sunni, but you replace the country by uh, putting the minority in the governing uh, you know, uh, position. The same as in Syria. Assad is, uh, is governing uh, Syria with 70% of them Sunni. What happened next, then you push the Sunni out and then you have the IS, you know, with their own brand of Salafi jihadist notion, without talking about religion from love, uh, sabar, hijrah, and others that you may kindly mention. And so I think even that reality uh, around us, I think there's a need for Muslims to call into questions um, the ways of the world uh, that is taking us in the violent road, but it's not enough to criticize it. We have to find ways to transform it. And what I'm trying to do today is tonight is simply to share with you some of my thoughts on possibilities. Possibilities that we can find nonviolent alternatives from within Islamic soils, from examples from Islam, and then present it as an alternative to the world that is in need of such alternative. I think this is our job as a researcher, this is our job as educator, most importantly, this is our, my job and your job as Muslims because we are living in this world, as you rightly said, our religion is about any, you know, not about um, fighting and, and, and violence and killing. It's about compassion. And it's compassion that will eventually save the world, I hope. So, Bin Dahi Taufik, Wa Hidayah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.